Hey, good afternoon, everybody. How y'all doing? All right, we're going to talk about proven restaurant systems once we cool that audio down a little bit there. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, what I want to do, because I know we're in Vegas, you guys probably had late nights last night or had the trouble to get in here with all the weather in the Midwest. I want to start off with something a little bit easy. I want to just watch a short video clip here, okay? There are three people in white shirts. There are three people in black shirts. And what I want you to do silently to yourself, do not say anything out loud, but silently to yourself, count how many times the people in the white shirts bounce the basketball. All right, now for those of you all that have not seen this video clip before, how many times did the people in the white shirts bounce the ball? 10, 11, 12, 11, 9, so anybody see more than 12? No, okay, was 14, you can have these, they'll work a little better than yours, all right? The, the proper answer is 10 or 11. If you count the one that bounced off the person's head, it's 11. If you don't count it, it's 10. Now, that's only part of the reason I show this video because obviously we all watch the same video and I heard 9, 10, 11, 12, and then you were just playing along and saying 14. How many of you that had not seen this video clip before, though, saw the gorilla that was in it for one-third of the time you were staring at the screen? I'm going to show you the same video clip again. You guys are going to think this is not, a video, this is not Vegas magic. Why did 90% of us miss the gorilla on the screen? You were hyper-focused on pounce, there's the pounce, there's, a, there's the gorilla right there, okay? That gorilla was in the video for eight of the 25 seconds you were staring at the screen. Now, we're all in the restaurant, the pizza business, we have to be observant with what's going on. We get tunnel vision sometimes. You all coming to this show is a good example of kind of stepping out of the tunnel and taking a look at what's going on out there. So what I want to do is share with you a little bit about my background. Now, I actually, uh, my name is TJ Shear. These sessions are going to be uh, audio recorded if you guys want to get those. And I have a lot of slides, and it, my email will be on the last slide. So if you want a PDF of the presentation, just shoot me an email. After we're done, my email's on the last slide, okay? I actually spent 20 years at Chuck E. Cheese Pizza. Anybody ever been to Chuck E. Cheese? Voluntarily? No, okay. Um, does anybody go there for the awesome pizza? Does anybody go there for the ridiculously low prices? No, they don't. Why are they so successful? If you think they've been in business for 40 years, they own a segment like nobody owns a segment. Why are they, why are they so successful? It's an experience. It's for the kids. And, and, and I learned long ago, if we can put systems into place, we can replicate those things. So I worked for Chuck E. Cheese for about 20 years. Uh, I took a year off to go through rehab just to get kind of all that out of my system. If you guys have ever been in there, there's a lot of kids. They scream, they cry. It's a little crazy. But I, I bleed pizza sauce like you all. And I spent the last 18 years consulting and speaking on a lot of, with a lot of pizza companies, a lot of other hospitality companies, and a lot of franchise business on how to multiply what you do, whether it's to grow sales in one location or it's to grow location counts. So I've worked with a number of brands out here, and about 11 years ago, I became a franchisee of a sandwich brand called Witch Witch Superior Sandwich, is based in Dallas. They have about 400 units. Anybody ever been to a Witch Witch? All right, there are a lot more than one 10 years ago when I asked. Um, I, I currently own five locations. Well, let me let me rephrase that. I own four locations and one charity. Okay, for those of y'all that own restaurants, anybody have a nonprofits out there? Okay, I got one. All right, I had another one, but it closed down. Darn. Um, we are very different. We are a very different sandwich place. Is the pizza segment hyper competitive? Yes, it is. So is the sandwich segment. It's hyper, hyper competitive. And so what I've done over the past 11 years, and if anybody wants to call BS on me, I have a guy that used to work with me sitting in the front row who now works for Boston Pizza. So if you want to fact check any of this stuff, I got, it. I got a guy right here in front, okay? My average unit volumes are 30% higher than the other, market, the other franchisees in the markets I compete in. I have stores in Dallas. I have stores outside of Austin. I have stores in Houston. Okay, my average volumes are 30% higher. My sales trend, just to give you an idea, we're, we're not always up. My sales trend is somewhere between 3 and 4% better 
than whatever the system average is. Year to date this year, I'm flat. Our concept is down a number I don't want to say publicly because I'll get in trouble, okay? But it's less than zero. My business case to you all as owners is this stuff works. I've written a couple books, one on how to motivate employees called Send Flowers to the Living, a couple others on how to put systems into restaurants and how to hire, recruit, and train. I'm doing a seminar specific to hiring and training tomorrow morning at 9.30. I will touch on it today because it is one of the important systems here, but if you do want to get into a deeper dive, I'll do that tomorrow as well. All right, so let's get through it. 2005, video iPod comes out. I'm a training consultant. And I figure out how to take what is then training in DVDs and stick it into a video iPod. And I write an article on this company in Tennessee called Pal Sudden Service. Most of you all have probably never heard of them. That is their actual building. It is a 1,100 square foot drive through only restaurant. They sell hamburgers, hot dogs, shakes, and fries. If you're from the Southeast, you think Sonic without all the crazy desserts. But it's a drive through The average unit volume is $2.3 million on a $4.80 check average. They are a single lane drive through They push 200 cars an hour through one drive through lane. I started working with these guys because they were the first restaurant to ever win the Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award and I, I actually learned more from them than I could ever teach them. 2% management turnover, 37% employee turnover, I don't know if you track your employee turnover. Mine was 84% last year. The average in the QSR kind of fast casual arena is around 120. 37%. One mistake every 3,700 orders. Can you imagine how easy your life would be as a manager and owner if your employees made one mistake every 3,700 orders? They have a recipe for everything. They know exactly how many pens or pencils is the ideal number to have in that restaurant. It's all about systems because systems help you replicate things to grow. And you can go for, how many of you all own multiple units or are part of a system that has multiple units? Okay, just a smaller, but if everybody's doing things the same way and something's off, it's easier to figure out what's wrong as the owner. When everybody's doing their own thing, it's real difficult to figure out why one person has a cost of goods problem, one person's service is better, or one person's labor's higher, or their pizza quality. So it's all about systems, and I learned it from these guys long ago. So put all that together, 20 years of Chuck E. Cheese, 10, 12 years consulting, which, which, which pals, here is the success for me. If you want to take a picture of one slide, this is it. This is the answer that you need today, okay? It's this simple. It really is this simple. Actually, I'm going to break it into to these seven effective systems, okay? And I want to go through them all. Again, we got about an hour and 15 minutes today. Mission operations, how to hire, how to train, reward, how to focus on profitability. This is going to be like the gorilla, ladies and gentlemen. It's there. You may not just see it. I would bet at the end of the day today, I'm not going to tell you too many things you didn't know or haven't heard before, but just like that gorilla, you didn't see it because you got tunnel vision. So I'm going to pull you outside the tunnel and let's go. We're going to start with mission. Now I want to do a real simple exercise. Okay, I want everybody to just close your eyes, close your eyes, point what direction you believe north is, hint it's not straight up in the air. Okay, so everybody just point what direction you believe north is. Just pick a direction, it's real hard to... All right, so everybody open your eyes, keep your hands where they're pointed. They're pointed all over the place, okay? North is actually this direction. Now everybody's pointing this way, thinks you're badass, because, oh, I got it right. I'm Okay, well, I got it right, too, because I have an app on my phone, all right? It's not that hard. This was not a geography test. What this was was an illustration of what we deal with in our restaurants each and every day. When your employees do not understand what the mission is, something happens different to every guest. If we can get everybody to understand what true north is, and in my business, true north is make the guests say wow. I made an easy slogan that every employee could understand. That is our true north. So when I get a complaint, and this happens in my world just as it does to you, I get an email complaint that says, I went to your restaurant at 8.58 and it's closed at nine and the doors were locked. And I get shocked and go, that would never happen in my restaurants. And I look at the video cameras and what did I see at 8.55? Click. So I call up my manager and I say, Scooter, 
What is our mantra? Make the guests say wow. Okay, good, glad you know it. What did locking the doors five minutes early have to do with making the guests say wow? I was trying to save labor. Okay, maybe I didn't clearly under, maybe I have over communicated labor, I don't know, it could be my fault. But that's what we go to with our true north. When a coupon comes in to my restaurant that is from another franchisee's location that I don't own, I don't want my employees to turn around and ask the supervisor. I don't want them to call me. I don't want them to text me. What do I want them to do? Take the coupon. Because the little angel should pop up on the shoulder and say, make the guests say wow. We have to get everybody to understand True North. You have to have your guests understand what it's like. When you go into a Starbucks, ask them the next time to just flip the front of their apron over. Because their mantra is right there. We create inspired moments in each customer's day. And then they have four pillars, anticipate, connect, personalize, and own. Now, it's a little hokey, but when they put that apron on, the last thing they see is their mantra. You have to have everything that you do focus in on that mantra. In my case, it's make the guests say, wow. So when somebody walks out of the men's room in my, restaurant, in my restaurants, on the back of the door, I only put it in the men's room, it says, should I shake your hand? Think about that for just a second, all right? Because what do I want the guests to say even when they're walking out of the restroom? Wow. Make the guests say wow. Wow, your employees are friendly. Wow, you have 41 different sandwiches. Wow, you have 52 toppings on your sandwiches. Wow, I don't know what drugs you give your employees, but they're sure friendly, so keep giving them those drugs. We have the true north. We have to make the guests say wow. Brands do this extremely well. Hard Rock is one of the best ones. Everything that they do, product, facility, and people, all resonates rock and roll. I was speaking at a conference in the Dominican Republic at a Hard Rock Hotel, and on the way to the pool was this. Now, this is absolutely the dumbest thing you could ever imagine. Free air guitars. What were all these people doing as they would walk out to the pool? They would grab the guitar and do their Jimi Hendrix or whoever it was that they like, and I'm going, this is, this is so stupid. Now, please, don't leave this seminar and put the free air guitars bike rack holder in your restaurant because it won't fix anything because that's not who you are. When you go by the wet floor sign in the Hard Rock, it says slippery when wet, Bon Jovi. When you go to the ATM in the casino, it says come on, take the money and run, Steve Miller. Everything they do reeks of rock and roll. What is it that you do and make sure it falls into that mantra? If you don't have that mission, Good luck trying to do this because you won't have clarity with your staff. This is one of my clients in St. Louis. That's the men's room door. That's the ladies' room door. Now, most of you may not get this, and you might think this is a sexist deal. But if you look closely at the picture on the right there, in the wood around the door frame, there's a bunch of Sharpies all over that. And their brand is about writing on the walls. So if you didn't know that, you would see this and go, oh, that's offensive. That's a sexist joke. That doesn't make any sense. But it's who they are. And it's all about their brand. So make sure you have that mission and it's clearly understood. Now, the next thing we need to do is put that into place with operations. Now, how many of you all do delivery? The vast majority of you guys? Third party. Do you do it yourselves or third party? Or both? Both. Okay. I'm probably guessing which ones you like better. Just, just guessing. Okay, but there's a John Deere commercial that says it's not how fast you mow, it's how well you mow fast. It's not how fast you mow, it's how well you mow fast. See, pals doing 200 cars an hour through a drive through means nothing unless they have one mistake every 3,700 orders. Because what do we all do as customers when we go through the drive through What's the first thing we do when the food comes out into our bag? What do we do? We check it. Why? Because most of the time, it's not right. My first experience I ever went through with PALS, I was actually writing an article on their company about the best restaurant training company in the United States for QSR Magazine back in around 2005. I'd never been to Kingsport, Tennessee. It is way in the sticks on the 100 miles east of Knoxville. I said, I got to go do some research. So I pull into the drive through I go through, I order, it's 3 in the afternoon, I order Frenchy fries and a large Diet Coke. $2.12. I pull around, 
because you order face to face, then you pull around the building, you pay and get your food at the same time. Now I'm trying to be the good customer. I give her $10 and 12 cents. And she says to me, you've never been here before, have you? And I'm like, oh my God, how the heck, they are good. How did they know that? I have a Tennessee license plate on the car. How do I know that? So I asked the obvious question of her, how did you know that? And she says, well, we've already trained the customers, don't give me the 12 cents. I have your food, your drink, and your 88 cents here. I'm ready to get you right out the door. I mean, literally, it's kind of like the train picking up the mail back in the old days. You just, there, there's a hand out the window with a bag of food, and she's got her change there, and she is ready because the average car pays and gets their food in 18 seconds. It's phenomenal. Hint, they actually have to understand math at the cash register. Any of y'all, no offense, I'm 53, okay, so I actually had to learn addition and subtraction when I went to school, all right? Any of you guys ever go to a restaurant or have an employee like this, and the total, like in my case, is 1004? I had this happen the other day in my restaurant. It was 1004. The customer gives the kid a $20 bill. He hits the $20 bill on the register screen. Then he goes, oh, I got the four cents here. You'd have thought the kid's hard drive crashed. <laughs> it was just like, what do I do? I'm like, Scooter, it's $9.96 plus four cents. Give him a $10 bill back. How hard is this? But it's not how fast you mow. It's how well you mow fast. If you want to deliver a great guest experience, you have to have the right people. Here's the business case for this. I have over 15,000 surveys in my restaurants. I will tell you the two drivers, the two drivers of success operationally are employee friendliness and pace of the meal. You want to drive customer satisfaction, customer referrals, customer attention. It's employee friendliness and it is pace of the meal. Now obviously if you're in a Delco situation, that means getting the delivery there quickly or when they say it's going to be there. If they're coming in to pick it up, it's ready when they say it's ready. If you're in full service, the appetizers, the minute that's taking that last bite of the appetizer, boom, the entrees are coming out. Not on top of each other and those kind of things. But in regards to friendliness, if we get a five, and I've seen this in my full service clients, almost the exact same numbers. If we get a five on employee friendliness, 91% of the people give us a five on the taste of the food. If we get a four on employee friendliness, 37% of the people give us a five on the taste of the food. Think about that for just a second. I guarantee in my case, the sandwich tastes the same. In your case, the pizza tastes the same. But because we are friendlier, and keep in mind, this is five versus four. This is not five versus some rude kid that's on his phone texting right in front of the customer. This is five versus four. 91% versus 37%. You want people to walk out that door and love your brand and tell everybody else your employees have to be hyper-friendly above and beyond. It's doable. I know this generation doesn't even want to look people in the eye. I think they worry about getting pregnant by just looking people in the eye. We have to teach skills that we didn't have to teach before. They're not comfortable with it because they're looking down at the phone. Doesn't it really piss you off when the customers are like that the whole time? When they're sitting there on their phone and you're at a register trying to order at a full service restaurant? And come on, man, let's, let's at least be good customers. It makes it a little easier to give good customer service. So we need to put systems in place. Here's a few ideas that may work for your brand. You go to Bubba Gump Seafood Shrimp Company. They have a red license plate and a blue license plate. It's to teach all the servers they have a system. If you see the blue license plate that says run for us, run, the servers just see a sea of blue. They don't stop. What happens when a red license plate sticks out on the table? Stop for us, stop. What is the server taught to do? Go over there and find out what that guest needs. Doesn't matter whose section it is. Doesn't matter whose station it is. Doesn't matter if they're off the clock or they're on break. They see a red license plate, they stop. If you've been to like a high-end Brazilian steakhouse like Fogo de Chão, or however you say it, all right? Fogo de Chão. I don't know how you say Fogo de Chão out of C-H-A-O, but what does the red and the green disc mean? What does the green disc mean? More meat. What does the, green, what does the red one mean? I would love to do this with iced tea, okay? Because how many of you are like me where you get like halfway through the iced tea and you got the ratio just right and then they come and they pour more iced tea and they're thinking they're doing you a favor. What are you doing? Ah, oh, man, you're messing it up. Stay away or bring me more. When you've ever been to a witch, which if you've ever been there, it's one of the most confusing places you could ever be because typically in a sandwich place, you go up to an order counter or to a register and order. 
And here you come in and you fill out a bag. There's 12 different bags. And there's 48 different toppings on the bag. So a lot of people come in here, they don't say, wow, they say, holy bleep. Because all they want is a sandwich, and this is taking the simple and making it complicated. And so we had to put in a system because we saw our survey numbers from regulars to first-timers with a gap of about 25 points. Basically, the first-timers hated us because they didn't understand it. So we put a little sticker on the bag of a first-timer. Real ingenious, it's a one. All we did is teach the same employees that were scoring a 67 with first-timers yesterday and scoring a 90 with first-timers today because we taught them what the one meant. If and only if you see a one sticker on the bag, this guest has never been here before. So when I come up to the register and give them the sticker with the one on it, what is the cashier saying? First time here. Helping them out a little bit, reassuring their choices on the sandwich. Making sure everything's done right. And it's your first time here, by the way, you get a free large 32 ounce plastic cup, you can bring it back for discounted refills, and boom, we'll automatically enroll you in our loyalty program. What did the guests say the minute they walked away from the register? Wow, funny how it fit right into our mantra, didn't it? Now what does the one mean? Now th keep in mind, we don't have an order that goes back to the kitchen and prints on a ticket, but we could do this very easily because the bag gets hung up on the line. What does the one mean to the person making the food? Put a little of this in there. Put a little of this. Yes, I know you're supposed to make them all perfect. Now, if you have a register system and you're not hanging bags on a zip line like we are, you just put a button in there that says first timer and it prints in the kitchen, same thing. Put a little love in there. Now, what does the person delivering the food to that guest now know about them that they can personalize the experience with? First time, enjoy it. Check back with them, make sure it's okay. Drop them a bounce back maybe. Now, for those of you all that have full service restaurants, we did this. You want to teach your servers how to make more money? We taught the hosts to talk to the guests on the way to the table, which I know is very, very different than what you experience in most full service restaurants. Typically, I believe host training in most full service restaurants, you teach them Chinese. Hi tu, follow me, throw the menus down, and that's it. You never talk to the guests on the way to the table. You just throw the menus down and off you go. But what the host did was talk to the guests on the way to the table, and they would code a guest check and put it face down. C for celebration, Q for a quick meal, one for a first time, or so on. So if I walk up to a table as a server and I flip it over and I see Q1, what does that mean? They're in a hurry, first time here. Do I take care of a guest that's in a hurry and never been here before versus somebody that's a regular that's celebrating something? Oh, yes, you do. So what we did was taught all the servers how to take care of each different type of guest. What do you think happened to the server tip percentages? Shot up from 18% to 22%. This is so simple to do. You can do this with your phone answering system for delivery orders the same way. I spoke to Papa John's conference about 10 years ago, and I spent a Friday night in one of their restaurants, and I was shocked the way they were answering the phone because everybody's caller's information would pop up back then. This was way before online ordering was prevalent. And the kid's answer on the phone, that person's ordered here three times in the last year, and he's answering the phone the same way for the person that's ordering for the 52nd time, and it's June. And I'm thinking to myself, I fly American Airlines all the time. I'm platinum. I get treated a lot better than the average person that flies once a year. You have systems and technology at your disposal right now. Use it to customize your operations and make your service a lot better. Then with this generation, you have to go through and define each interaction point that you have with the guests. And they're different in full service versus cashier versus on the phone or online. Heck, nowadays, you may not even inter interface with your customers all digitally. So you can really even add those interaction points. But each one of those things can be positive, negative, or neutral. You walk into a Chick-fil-A, and if you say thank you to somebody in Chick-fil-A, what do they say to you? They don't say, no problem, dude. What do they say? They say, my pleasure. Okay, that's a lot different than no problem. When you go into most quick service restaurants, what is the cashier interaction like? Next, anything else, anything else, next, anything else? Those are not positive interactions. That is not employee friendliness, that's a five. That's more like a two or three. That will not drive your taste of your food. That will not drive intent to return and recommend. I also urge you to have some non-negotiable behaviors. 
things that they are always going to do and things that they will never do. I have a friend of mine who runs a high-end hair salon in Cleveland, $100 average haircut. Place opens right across the street, puts up a sign in the front window. We do $10 haircuts. We get this all the time. What happens in the pizza business? What does everybody compete on? Price. So everybody got all worried in his, in his, his salon and says, well, John, they're doing $10 haircuts. They're doing $10 haircuts. You know what? He put up a sign that says, we fix $10 haircuts. <laughs> Think about how we can deliver a better experience to our guests. Because when somebody comes in to one of my restaurants and says, do you own the witch witch in fill in the blank? I cringe sometimes. Or I feel great sometimes. Because when somebody says, oh, do you own the witch witch across town? No, I don't. Well, gosh, it's so much worse than yours. I feel really good on one hand and I feel really terrible on the other hand. Because thankfully they came in to my restaurant even after they had a bad experience with our brand. We have to have a consistent mindset with the guest that knows what they're gonna get when they call you up or order online or see your logo driving down the road on a sign or if they're gonna order from you. Where am I gonna go eat tonight? Because as an example, if they're unclear, they're going somewhere else. Is this sign very clear? Don't let worries kill you, let the church help? I think it might be uh, not, not quite so clear, right? Uh, this works great for marketing, but probably not ideal for how our guests would think of our service levels. And of course, please do not make mistakes, especially if you're doing delivery or somebody takes it to go because when they get home, it's now a grudge call that they have with you. Because we all know if everything goes great, I'll give you a perfect example. I, I spoke in Boston yesterday. Okay, so I had a long flight here, probably like many of you guys did, but I, I had to lay over in Phoenix. I decided, you know what, I'm just going to check my bag because I don't want to mess with it. So I, I, first of all, it snowed in Boston two hours after I left, which was awesome. I didn't get stuck there, okay? I get upgraded because I fly an American lot. I get to sit in first class from Boston all the way to Phoenix. That's six hours. That was good. They serve free cocktails up there. I liked it. Paid the same price as my ticket for Southwest Airlines. I get here. My bag doesn't get here. Now what just happened to what I just experienced with first class and free drinks all the way here is exactly what happens when we screw up, okay? One mistake undoes a lot. So we have to put systems into place. Now, watch this video to tell me if systems are the answer. That's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello! There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now. Would somebody please do something? Help! 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 Now, I'm a franchisee, okay? I could have built TJ's sandwich shops, but I chose to become a franchisee and buy somebody else's system. In essence, instead of me building a staircase, I bought an escalator, okay? You putting systems into your restaurants is building an escalator. When an employee is given the choice between take the stairs and take the escalator, what do the vast majority of them do? They take the escalator, why? It's easier. Most franchisees and then any system, they buy a system, they get on the escalator, and what do most people do when they get on the escalator? They stand there, who does all the work? The system. What do highly motivated people do when they get on an escalator? They walk. What do highly motivated people do when they're walking up an escalator and somebody's just standing there like this, blocking their way? You, yeah, you get annoyed because you're trying to get somewhere faster. Somebody's in my way. Your people are going to determine how successful your systems are. Yes, you may create a system that breaks. The escalator becomes a staircase at that point. What do you need to do if you have a broken system but you have good people? What are they gonna do? 
They're gonna walk up the stairs. They're just gonna make that escalator a staircase. So let's talk a little bit about hiring. Now again, I'm gonna talk about this for a lot longer tomorrow, but it is one of the most important systems you can put into place. If you have that mission and you've defined what you want people to do operationally, think about what the NFL has done the last few days. Okay, what did all the NFL teams do the last few days or the college kids do? Anybody have any idea? They had the combine, and I'll explain to you in a little. Basically, it's tryouts. Don't you wish we could have tryouts in our restaurants <laughs> to see if these kids could actually do this? Heck, we're lucky they can just even come in when they have an interview scheduled, right? Whew, it's tough. It's tough out there. But if you think about this, now who won the Super Bowl a couple months ago? The Patriots. Man, I tell you, I had to sit up there yesterday in Boston, Massachusetts, and we just celebrated in Dallas our 25th anniversary of the last time we won the Super Bowl, right? In fact, I was driving to the airport the other day and I saw a bumper sticker that said, go Cowboys and take the Mavericks with you. That's how bad it is in Dallas right now, okay? And I had to get up to Boston and they won the friggin' Super Bowl for the sixth time. 31 teams did not win the Super Bowl. One team did. What are the 31 teams doing that didn't win? What are they trying to do? They're trying to improve. This is what you need to do with your business right now. And it starts with creating a manpower plan. This is very rudimentary and you might think it's basic. But the NFL, there's 53 players that they are allowed to have on their roster. At the end of the year or at the end of the football season, some of the contracts wear out. They expire. If you're in Dallas, a couple of people get suspended for drugs again. Okay? So now all of a sudden, what happens to our football team? We have some holes to fill. Now, we didn't make the Super Bowl, so what else are we trying to do with our team? We're trying to improve. So in your case, sit down and go through with your team members. Rank them A, B, or C. A is the person that is your rock star. B is the person I call them who's closing tonight because they walk in and they go, hey, man, who's closing tonight? Because if it's the manager with high standards, what do they do? They behave right. If it's a manager with low standards, what do they do? They slack. And then the C person, they could win the lottery and they would complain they had to pay taxes on it. You know who those people are. They complain about everything. What do we need to do with our C players? Upgrade them. Why do we keep the C players? Because they never quit. The C players never quit. You know it's true. They stay because you let them. People call me all the time, TJ, how do I get people to come in in uniform? How do I get people to come in on time? That's all you accept. I know that sounds very, very simplistic, but that is what you have to do. At PALS, if you're late two times in six months, you're fired. How many employees do you think you'd have working for you right now? Zero, right? But they have a system to hire people. I have a very elaborate 15 minute assessment that people have to go through. And if you think about it, I got a couple holes here, I got a couple upgrades there. When somebody comes into my restaurant and they have the droopy pants down to here and they go, hey man, y'all hiring? I know what I wanna say, right? I wanna say go walk, work at my competitor across the street, I heard they're hiring, right? But I tell them, yeah, we sure, go to smartrestaurantgroup.com, fill out our online assessment and we'll get an email as soon as you do and we'll be in touch. What does that slacker, droopy pants kid do when he logs in on his phone or his computer and it sees he has to take a 15 minute assessment? He self-selects out. I get very, very few people that are red because they don't even wanna go through the trouble of doing this. But I start with a manpower plan. I have an A, a B, and a C. You have to understand turnover. If you do not understand how turnover impacts your business, you're always gonna be running uphill. As an example, if you have an ideal staff of 20 people that you need to work for you, and currently you have 19, how many people do you need to hire? Aggies in the room, we're gonna say one. I went to the University of Texas, okay? The Aggies in the room, we're gonna say one. By the way, do you guys know what the Aggies call the Longhorns at work? Boss, okay? Yes, and do you know why Texas is so dry? Because Oklahoma sucks, okay? That's my last football joke, all right? If you don't laugh, it's a FedEx joke, you'll get it tomorrow, okay? Now, I don't need to hire just one because if I have 100% turnover, so if I turn over 100% of my staff in a year, how many am I gonna turn over every quarter, roughly? If 
five, a quarter of 20. So if I, have tw if I need 20, I'm going to lose five in the next three months. I, have I need six people. That's a lot of people. It's not just one. And if we approach it like this and figure out, let alone I might have to probably upgrade some of my C players, okay? Every August, everybody sits there and says, oh, my gosh, school's about to start. I'm going to be short-staffed because everybody's starting to school. You knew that in May. Plan ahead. Plan ahead. So create that manpower plan. And then you have to understand, and this is what I'll delve into more tomorrow, the talent chips or the traits that are make a good driver are different from a good cashier. They're different from a good bartender. They're different from a good pizza cook. They're all different. Somebody that has night availability versus day availability, weekends or weekend, weekdays. When you're trying to match their wants with your needs, you have to find a fit. I saw this as an eye chart. Don't even worry about this. But if you think about the NFL combine, as an example, 225 bench press reps. How many can you do? First column, quarterback, not applicable. They don't even care how many times a quarterback can bench 225. Running back, 20. Fullback, 22. Wide receiver, 12. Tight end, 22. Offensive tackle, 24. Guard center, defensive tackle, 26. See, when we try and hire people, typically it's like, oh, hey, can you close tonight? Come on in. You're hired. Thank God you showed up. All these traits are different by position. You have to know. What does a cashier need a little more of? Or what does a server need a little more of versus a delivery driver? Define those traits and look for them when you interview. It makes a big difference because it'll help you solve your turnover issue if you hire better. That's why I use a hiring system. There's four or five out there. I do that assessment purposely for a reason because if it com comes back green, I know that person has integrity they have a slant to customer service. They want to be productive with a sense of urgency and play on a team that wins. That's what I want because I want to make the guests say, wow. If that's not what your team wants to do, hint, see the Cleveland Browns? I mean, it's real hard to fix a problem where you don't win. So how many of you all are out there fishing right now trying to get talent? How many of you all use some of these websites? Yeah? There's a bunch of new ones out there that if you haven't really paid attention recently, you need to go out there and look at them. If you think about Uber for a second, how many of us use Uber or Lyft? Almost everybody. Why do employees, wait, they're not employees. Why do the independent contractors like working for Uber and Lyft? They can work when they want. And then they come to work for us, and what happens? Yeah, you need to be here Friday at 4 o'clock and stay till midnight, and Saturday from 4 to midnight. This is like making their brains explode. It's very different. There, are, there literally are websites now called, like, called Shift Gig that you can hire people just like getting an Uber driver. I do this one week a year in New Braunfels, Texas, when my $12,000 store does $36,000 worth of catering in a span of seven days for a band contest. I just get a whole bunch of people from Shift Gig to come in because that's when I need them. They love it, fits my need. Boom. My employees love it because they don't have to get killed and work through all this stuff. But if you think about recruiting, it's like fishing. You have to put a bunch of hooks in the water. You have to fish at the right time. You have to have the right bait on the hook. You can't just spray and pray Craigslist and hope. But FYI, if you do Craigslist, the number one time Craigslist is looked at for jobs is Saturday morning. So if you post a Craigslist job on Monday, what page number is it on by Saturday morning? Yeah, they're never, the applicants are never going to see it. But if you post it late Friday night, where are you going to be Saturday morning when they decide to start looking for a job? Boom. you got to fish when the right time with the right bait. And you have to have a message out there. If you have these C player losers working for you, and they're your cashier, or they're the person answering your phone, or they're the delivery driver, and their customer service skills are terrible, and you have this mom or dad or somebody looking to maybe come work for you and their interaction with your business is this loser, you might as well just put this sign up in front of your restaurant, okay? Because that's what you're telling people when a C player interacts. Or this. Figure that one out, okay? Now, many of us put out now hiring ads. 
is this ad, and I know you're not gonna hire bus drivers, I'm not telling you to put, an ad, put your ad on the top, a side of a school bus. That ad is not gonna get anybody's attention. But an ad like this that says, get paid 16, 25 an hour to do what most parents do for free or don't take your work home with you, in fact it would be illegal. Those type of ads are better bait. They will get more people to come in for you. I walked into a Chick-fil-A in Waco, Texas a couple weeks ago. I couldn't believe Chick-fil-A needed to hire people. But if you look at what their message says, now investing in hospitality professionals. They are not looking for that saggy pants loser walking down the street. They are looking for hospitality professionals. This is in Texas. Minimum wage is still $7.25 an hour. Not that we can hire anybody at $7.25 an hour. But they offer premium pay, but their message says something totally different than now hiring cooks and cashiers. Can you change your message around differently to make it a little more attractive? Here's some other cool things I've seen. IKEA, when Toys R Us announced they were closing all their toy stores and going bankrupt, did a virtual career fair for Toys R Us employees. Hello, a bunch of people just jumped in the application pool and IKEA went in there hard with a big net and got them. Genius. I still haven't figured out how McAllister's does work today, get paid tomorrow, but again, why do people that work for Uber and Lyft work for Uber and Lyft? When can they get their money? Tomorrow. Not, oh yeah, your first paycheck's two weeks from Friday and we gotta teach the kids a calculus equation, the pay period ends here, and then your check gets there and all those other kind of things. This was in a little sticks town my mother-in-law lives in outside of Austin, Pizza Hut delivery driver, $300 sign-on bonus, $20 an hour. Now many of you, I may cringe at this, $20 an hour, but when you're paying a $13 an hour employee overtime, how much are they getting? $20 an hour. When you have to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars recruiting them and pissing all the money away on ineffective ads, you can get a $300 signing bonus saved real quick. You have to get aggressive with these things and you have to think outside the different, okay? Now once we actually get people to the interview, if you just drop down on your knees and go, oh, thank you, Jesus, you're here, you're hired, if it is this difficult to get a job with you, okay, you're never going to solve your problem. If it's this simple, it's not going to get fixed. And again, I'll talk about this more tomorrow. But your, your interviews need to be behavior-based. I love what IKEA does. You want to work here? Make a chair and take a seat. Because what do they want you to do with IKEA? Put together furniture. We have to have behavior-based interviews. Because all of these kids have been coached to say what we want. And in fact, when we see somebody actually show up, especially if they have good image and appearance, what is our brain or our gut telling us right then about that person? Oh, oh you're so, hire them right now. They could be a sociopath for all we know. But what happens when our gut just goes, oh, they look pretty good? What, what type of questions do we ask them? We just pitch them softballs. Oh, you're going to come in on time, right? Oh, yeah, you'll cover all those tattoos, right? Yeah, you'll do this, oh, whatever. We make it so simple. You would never steal from me, would you? You're, you're not going to be late, are you? What, are, what is our brain telling our gut right now? They're just reinforcing what our gut feel is, and we want to hire this person. They have to be behavior-based, because how many times do you hire somebody and they leave after a day or a shift or two? Our fault. My daughter, when she was 18, got hired to work in a Mexican food restaurant. She'd never worked, she worked at Witch Witch for me for a couple years, but she goes to apply to be a host at a Mexican food restaurant. Her first day on the job, I kid you not, was May the 5th. Anybody know what May the 5th is? That would be Cinco de Mayo. No training, no nothing, first shift, Cinco de Mayo host Friday night. How long do you think she lasted? Four hours. She punched out at nine o'clock. She didn't even go back and get her check. And I guarantee you, they probably sat there and went, oh, that hire, she was a piece of crap. <clears throat> no, you're a moron. And we do that too often. We do that too often, okay? So let's get into training a little bit because I, I grew up in the training realm and I always used to think training is more important than hiring. And, and I've changed my tune a little bit because it's kind of probably 5149. 
But I had a very eloquent boss one, one time that said to me, TJ, training is not as important as hiring because it's like polishing a turd, okay? You could polish that thing all day long, Mr. Trainer, but at the end of the day, you know what you got? You just got a shiny turd. So let's talk about training. How many of you all are in really small, independent, onesie, twosie, under five units? Most of you. What does your training materials look like? Th that part, right? It's, it's lore, it's word of mouth, everything's kind of passed down. Maybe Microsoft Word, right? Maybe a few PowerPoints and those kind of things. There is so much available to you if you just look. You want people to learn about dough, beer, wine, everything's online. Just go to YouTube or go to Google. I sit there and, and I, I'm working on a program right now for this Italian restaurant in, in, uh, in Boston and we're building all their training materials and it's wine training, liquor training, it's all there. And you can just make little QR codes for them to watch the videos. You don't even have to pay anything for it. Think about how you can leverage some of that. Some of the vendors, and I know all the liquor companies do this if you have this, but it, if you pour Coke and you're a full service restaurant, you can get tips for better tips to teach your servers how to make more money. A1 does the same thing. You can just Google A1 server training, it's there. You can just pull it off their website for free. If you have a full service restaurant, Google Cornell Mega Tips. It is a white paper done by a college professor that gives you the 14 behaviors, not that everyone is right for every concept, but that it teaches you 14 behaviors for servers to make more money. Because if I have a full service restaurant and I teach my servers how to make more money, are they likely to go look somewhere else? They're less likely. And I'm talking $5,000, $6,000, $7,000 a year more. That's significant. If we have a cashier or a phone-based environment, we have to do things a little bit differently, which I'll talk about in a second. Now, what I learned from PALS, they taught everybody with flashcards and PowerPoint. We want to train people so well they can't get it wrong. Most people just train people just enough they get it right instead of they train them so well they can't get it wrong. If you think about PALS, you're a new employee and you get dropped on this bullet train that's putting 200 cars an hour through a drive through you got to be really darn fast and really darn accurate to get in there. They teach you how to make one hamburger until you can make it fast enough that you won't tra crash their train. But then you can learn another one, and then you can learn another one. Because they train you so well, you can't get it wrong. And when people know their job so well, they don't have to think. What happens to order accuracy when they don't have to think? It goes up. What happens to their speed when it goes up? I, I saw this two weeks ago when we were coming home from Phoenix. My son lives in Phoenix. My wife and I were in the airport. My wife thinks she knows Spanish. She knows it a lot better than I do. But this lady started talking to her in Spanish. And she's trying to help her. But I have somebody fluent in Spanish talking to somebody that's semi-bilingual. What's going on in my wife's brain when somebody is speaking Spanish to her? She's trying to translate it to English. And what happens? The conversation slows down because she has to think. And then what happens when it goes back the other way? It's not quite right. We got to train our employees to be fluent in whatever you do. Now, I used to use flashcards, and my daughter yelled at me because I'm an old man. She says, get an app for that. So I found a flashcard machine app. My employees can just look at that. I took a page out of some of the other equipment manufacturers I saw. We actually make videos on QR codes. Everybody can just walk up on their phone and watch this. This could be a QR code for wine training. It could be a QR code for how to change the oil in a fry machine. In my case, I made specific videos, accuracy, speed, those kind of things. So if I have a problem that my guests are telling me you're too slow or you're making mistakes, I have all my employees watch the video for their position that day. No hardware required. Boom. Think about how you can leverage simple things like this. Generating QR codes is free. I'll be happy to tell anybody how to do it afterwards. It's real easy. The crazy thing is, I just saw an article about KFC. They stole my QR code idea right there, okay? They are testing right now. They have programmed Alexa in their kitchens to basically be a virtual ops manual. So when somebody says, Alexa, what's the recipe for breading chicken? Alexa can tell them. That's cool. Now I know we're all sitting here, I got old man Idis thinking, oh, they, they should learn that stuff and blah. What do these kids want to do right now? They don't want to learn information, what do they want to do? They just want to learn where to find it when they need it. That's the way to do it. For this, that's how they're wired. That is how they're wired. 
Good friend of mine works for Hard Rock and he says, train in the language they dream in. They're in 41 countries. They literally have to train in different languages. But technology is that they, they dream, the younger generation dreams in this. When you can do cool stuff like this, you can use this as a recruiting weapon. Because people will talk about your brand from an employer perspective and say, man, this is cool. All right, questions so far. Let's get into the rewarding part, the fun stuff. First and foremost, have a recognition currency. When somebody comes into Chuck E. Cheese, what do they win? The little kids, what do they win? Tickets. What do they buy with the tickets? Overpriced crap, right? I appreciate your honesty. Thank you. In my restaurants, we have what's called smart cards. They're worth a quarter. They save them up for whatever they want. They save them for as long as they want. I did a road show with A&W in Canada a couple years ago. They actually give everybody poker chips that are worth a dollar. When a manager sees somebody doing something right, they're rewarding them, or they get a great comment, or they stay late. Here's a perfect example. I have six people that are needed to run a busy Friday lunch in my restaurant. When Timothy right here doesn't show up at 1130, he texts me, hey, not coming in today, or hey, I quit, whatever. You've seen all the things, right? You hear it all. Timothy's not coming in today. What are the other five people thinking right now? Oh, great. Here we go. What's the guest service like that day during lunch when I'm one short? Sucks, right? Here's how you change this around. I go to my store and I say, hey, you five that are here on time, okay? Timothy's not coming in. I will give everybody four smart cards an hour. So basically, I'm going to pay you a dollar extra an hour. Two caveats. No mistakes. Nothing goes over our standard cook time. Now, what are those five people going to do that day? They're going to bust it. What is the guest experience going to be like that day? Great. Now, do the simple math of this. What did I have to pay these five people per hour to get done what I needed to get done? $5. Let's assume Timothy makes $10 an hour. How much did I save as a business owner? $5. Now, I thought I needed six people to run lunch, but really, what do I need? I need five rock stars. I need five motivated rock stars. What are they all going to tell Timothy tomorrow? Don't come in. <laughs> Don't come in. The C players you have on their team, you are paying them. You are wasting money on them. And everybody thinks they need them, but they're just dragging the dead weight around. Get rid of the dead weight. Reward the people that are paying you, and it works better. Now, in my business, catering is really effective. You could use this spin on, on from a cost standpoint. But in my case, I try and get catering business, so I actually pay my employees 10% of any catering order they get me. I want, when somebody walks in to see, a, has a car dealer name tag or a coach from a school, I want them to start talking to them about my catering program. And if you look at that, I've got a $480 check, $295, $150. The biggest check I've written so far to date is $510. Now, I give them 10% of the order, so that $510 order was a $5,100 catering order. Because somebody sat there and used the clue from a customer that walked in with a Walmart name tag. They have a big warehouse right up the highway from our store. She started talking to him about catering. $510 check for her. $5,100 order for me. 800 people that had never eaten Witch Witch before getting to taste my brand. Win, win, win. Now, I am a cheap franchisee. I will tell you that is the same check in all the pictures. It is dry erase, okay? I got to draw the line somewhere with expenses, all right? 44 bucks, custom printed with my logo, bigcheck.com right there. But when your employees come to you and say, I want more hours, what do we always say to them? What do we need more of? Sales. I need more sales. Figure out how to motivate. You can do this with drive through windows or taking calls or business per hour and those kind of things. You got to think about those things. And I'll go more into the, the incentive ideas tomorrow because you could take that same idea I just told you and do cost savings, you give them a fraction of the action. Because again, if they can help you save money, but you put it all in your pocket, you're not gonna be a great place to work. Charles Barkley was watching the MD, he was announcing the slam dunk contest a few years ago. And he said, this guy does a dunk, wasn't very good, but the guy thought he was the baddest man on the planet. And he gets on the microphone and he says, hey Gerald, Gerald, hey Gatorade doesn't help people that suck. He yells it out in the, in the arena. Well, what does that mean to us? incentives will never get the wrong person to do the right thing. They won't. If those of y'all that are old enough to remember fast times at Ridgemont High, 
Okay, remember Spicoli? I, I went to high school for, or I went to, I was about to say I went to high school for 11 years. I went to school in Houston for 11 years. My three years of high school in Houston, if we had a C average or better, one absence or less, we did not have to take finals. What was the attendance like in my high school? Everybody was there. I moved senior year to New Jersey. They didn't have that same policy. How many days of school? I had never missed a day of school in like forever. How many days of school did I miss in New Jersey? A lot. Because I was incentivized to behave differently in Houston. And when the incentive went away, I behaved just like you. I did the bare minimum I would to just get my parents off my back. These incentives, if you do them, are not going to get the people that work for you that are the C players to behave any differently. Now, let's talk a little bit about profitability. Is that important for you guys? If I ask your employees, how much money do you think your owner makes out of every dollar in sales that comes in the front door? How do, what, how much, what do you think they're going to say? 80 cents, 50 cents. You've got to teach your employees. I would highly encourage you all, and some of you are all afraid to do this, I actually show all my management teams our P&L because I want them to understand I have a charity. I have a store that does not make money. It's tough, but we have to share with them. I want them to understand. There's not a lot of toothpaste left in this tube. Let's just be a little, be a little cautious with it. But they don't know that we run 25, 35% food costs, 25, 35% labor. How much does a pizza cost or a hamburger? They probably think it costs about a nickel. They don't understand. And when they see all this stuff on the shelves, they just think you're made of money. At orientation, or I would do this exercise at your next employee meeting, get $101 bills, assuming you have any left after your trip here to Vegas, okay? But get $101 bills and sit down with your employees at a meeting and say, hey, how much do you think we spend out of a dollar on food? 30 cents. How much do you think we spend on labor? 25, 25 would I have $100? $30, $25. What's my rent here? I love asking a kid what they think a rent in a 1,600 square foot restaurant costs. They're like, 1,000, 1,200? Hello, I have a 600 square foot mall food court. I pay $11,000 a month for rent. I show them the four little squares on the floor and go, yeah, see that square foot right there? That's $200. I pay $200 for those four squares every year. Count how many of those squares are in here. Then they go, oh my God because they think we just make a ton of money. But go through that exercise, and if you're lucky, there's $11 profit down there. I have some stores that make more than that, I have some stores that make a lot less. And some of you may be sitting in the room saying, well, I don't want them, I have a store that makes $100,000 a year, okay? What happens if I tell my employees this store makes $100,000 a year, what are they thinking? Oh my gosh, you're rich. You know what I tell them? You write a check for $350,000 to build this thing, okay? And now just, so take $350,000 out of the bank, Give it to this guy, and now it's going to take me how long to fill, just to get back to where I was, three and a half years. Yes, it looks like I'm making a lot of money here, but I want them to care and I want them to understand. I sit down with every kid I give a raise to and say, just want you to understand, if I'm giving you a dollar an hour and you work 40 hours a week, that's $2,000 I'm taking right now out of my pocket because I could make that $2,000 a profit. I'm giving it to you, but I need you to understand, what do I need from you? I need some cost reductions. I need some sales improvements. Because otherwise, you get $2,000 more and I get $2,000 less. Because every kid that comes up to me says, hey, TJ, I need a raise. Why do you need a raise? Because I got bills. What do I tell them? I got bills too. I got expensive bills. Right? We all know how expensive it is to run a restaurant. Teach them profitability. Teach your staff how to generate more sales for you. I think if there's two things you could do in regards to marketing, I'm not a marketing expert, but I am with a brand that is small relative to all the competitors, just like most of you. You're dealing with all those big guys that have big, big, big advertising budgets. But if you can teach your employees what I call sales radar, and you can go out and own the local community, you can make this work. This is another reason our sales are significantly better. Sales radar means three things. What happens during the transaction? What happens with your customer interactions? And what happens outside your restaurant? Start inside first, okay? Because I think most restaurants are horrible at suggestive selling. I think they're horrible about recommending unique items that you have that somebody else doesn't have. And so if I order a large pepperoni pizza in your restaurant, yeah, it may be good, but at the end of the day, it's still a pepperoni pizza. I tell my employees, talk to customer out of turkey. 
51% of our customers order turkey. I don't want them to order turkey. Why? It's not because I'm cheap and it's an expensive food cost item. Why do I not want our customer to order turkey? Everybody has it. I want them to order a black bean patty with hummus and hot pepper mix because you know what? You can't get that as a $5 foot long at Subway. You get them into your signature pizzas and they'll forget about that $5.99 Little Caesars thing that they got going on. We have to teach them sales radar. We have to teach them to suggestively sell. We have to teach them to ask questions the right way. Do you want dessert? Do you want an appetizer? That is not the way to ask a question. Hey, we're featuring two appetizers today, A and B, but my favorite is C. Which one can I get you? What's your specials today? Hey, we have this special deal today, two for $13.99 or one for $9. Which would you prefer? I guarantee you, if you said add a second pizza for $4.99 versus two for $13.99 or you can get one for $9, you will sell far more two for deals asking the right way. That's how you buy a car. You get in the fully loaded model and then you take out the options you don't want. We sell though in the base model and say, oh, add this, oh, add this, oh, add this. And the customer feels totally different. You gotta track it, you gotta keep score. Most POS systems, you can track your, whoever's answering your phones or taking the orders at the register or servers or bartenders to, tr to track their check average. Rank it because most of your employees probably think they're pretty good at doing it until they see how they stack up to everybody else. Teach them how to ask questions the right way. I would also urge you that if you don't have big marketing budgets to go out and do feed on the street with a little caveat. If you notice my coupons down there, it says store number and employee's name. I allow my employees, I get a 10,000 coupons printed. I tell them to write their names on them and go out, two caveats. They cannot give it to any customer that's about to pay. They can give it to a customer that's about to leave and they cannot give it to anybody that's coming into the parking lot already. I want them, when somebody walks in and they have a Best Buy shirt on and they come into my store, and I, I want them to say, how many employees do you have at Best Buy? Uh, 80? Here, take these 80 coupons and go give, put them in the break room there. Or a teacher, or they go to the car dealerships, and they get a quarter for every one of them that's redeemed. Now, what if I do this and no coupons get redeemed? What did it really cost me? 30, 40, 50 bucks to print these things? If I did a direct mail, 10,000 houses, and I get 100 redemptions, what happens? That cost me a fortune. I want everybody to be a salesperson. When somebody whines to me that says they want more hours, or they want a way to make more money, let's do this mutually beneficial. Go out there and hit feet on the street. This is the sole reason I am 7% different than my system this quarter. Because I have pushed this hard with my employees. And I'm writing checks for an employee for 15 bucks a week, 20 bucks a week. But when they all know their hours are going to get cut, not everybody's going to do it, but it makes a big difference. Not everyone is a salesperson, but everybody that works for us has to be a salesperson. And this is an easy way to do it, and it's very cost effective. You as an owner, when you need to kind of get outside, you need to pay attention to what events are going on. I'm amazed when we do kids fests, 5K runs, when you look, I always see Chick-fil-A, Whataburger, in down in Texas, they're at every event that goes on in the community and all they're doing is giving out coupons and giving out swag and those kind of things. We need to be involved. I viewed it a little more selfishly. I, I go out and I call these band contests and I, I'll figure out what bands are performing and I contact them all and I contact the host school and I say, look, I'll give you a dollar a box back for everybody if you promote me as the catering provider of choice for the contest. That's how I got 4,400 box lunches in San Antonio in four days, over a four, seven day span last year. That's why every Saturday in October I can do anywhere from 1,500 to 2,500 box lunches for band contests because I go to them and say, look, you guys promote us, I'll give your band a dollar a box. So if, they, if I end up selling 1,500 boxes, I raise my price a dollar so it's seven instead of six, I give them the dollar back, I still make my six bucks. But what marketing tentacles do we see when the host school's pushing this out and all the kids, what are y'all eating today? Which, 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 which? Boom. Pizza, y'all, it pisses me off because sandwiches are hard to make, okay? They're very time consuming. You guys can sell a big pizza, most of you all, for about what I can sell box lunch for. You have a competitive advantage from a cost standpoint. 
Go out there and get some of those things. Do fundraiser nights with the schools, and I know you're going to choke on this. Fun, uh, Chipotle does 50%. 50. It's a break-even proposition. I used to do 20. Nobody would come in, or I'd have to write them a check for like 50 bucks. Wow, that was great. That was awesome. You do 50%, what happens? A ton of people come in. I've done the math on this. I break even when I do a fundraiser at 50%, but I've also tracked, I on average bring in 20 new customers that have never been to a witch, which every fundraiser I do. So I broke even and I got 20 new customers. It cost me nothing to get 20 new customers. Look beyond just the I broke even that day. The schools love people that help them. When you get into digital, and I'm sure there's a whole bunch of digital ads on there, that's where our consumers are. It's hard to do direct mail. It's hard to do advertising and TV. There's a lot of people smarter than I am probably here doing these digital things. But what I would tell you is get on the third-party delivery systems for nothing else other than having your logo out there because that is where people are searching for food. It drives me nuts if somebody orders from DoorDash. They can order off which which is website and pick DoorDash, and i got to pay DoorDash 50 cents. If they order off DoorDash's website, i got to pay them 30%. But you know what? People forget about my brand. They forget about your brand. And if we can get in front of their eyeballs, it makes a big difference. So get out there with the digital ads and then take it a step further. These are the easy ones. This is low-hanging fruit. Go be the sponsor. So as an example, when I want to do the football meals for the school and I say, all right, I'll give you 250 bucks. You guys let me have all your meals for the whole season. Hint, it's around $10,000. And I want to be main prominent spot on your website. Because what do all the parents do? Where do they go when they want to find out information about that team or that group at the high school? They go to that website, the booster club and those kind of things. This costs you very, very little to get a lot of eyeballs on your logos. A couple things that you might want to look at. These do cost money. There's a new service out there called MyLSMX. It's about $79 a month. They have data for unbelievable amounts of people. You go in there and tell them, I'm a sandwich place or I'm a pizza place, and you describe your target customer to them, and then they have all this data, and they can tell you, all right, to direct mail the people that are just like this customer that you described, just those people, not everyone else, here's how much it would cost to do direct mail. Here's how much it costs to do the digital ads. Here's some other events going on in your area. Well worth a $79 a month investment to try it. Yes, you have to pay for the printing and those kind of things extra, but... I'm not an expert. You're not, maybe not a marketing expert. These are the kind of simple things to do. The other one that we found very, very effective is Every Door Direct, because you can actually pick postal zip codes or postal carrier routes within the zip codes. So as an example, I have a store in Houston. There's a freeway here. Everybody north of the freeway, which is the side I'm on, not my customer. Everybody south of the freeway, my customer. When I do direct mail in a three mile radius, typically, who do I hit? 50% of the people that are never coming in my restaurant. These, I can just pick the, the postal codes, and that's a zip code broken up into like six different sections. So I can pick the ones. These cost you anywhere from 33 to 50 cents, tax, tag, title, and license. List, pr printing, mailing, the whole deal. But it's more targeted. The redemption rates I see on these are 8 or 9% instead of 2 or 3%. Now, I'm just a little stupid old franchisee in Dallas trying to figure this out on my own. So if you are old enough to remember the old hair club for men president, right? I'm not just, a, not just a president, I'm a client. I am practicing what I preach. This is what I believe in. This is what I do. Because like with every door direct, you can actually go in there and set up the household income, the age, what the demographics are that you're looking for. So you only hit the people that are likely to be your customer. Make sense? All right, so we're wrapping up here. Those are the seven systems. I want you guys to do one simple exercise. And again, if you want the handouts, just shoot me an email. Just say you want the pizza slides. I'll probably send you both, whatever I do tomorrow, too, because it'll be easier that way. And you'll get two for one in case you're not here. But just shoot, my, uh, shoot me an email there. Everybody just make the OK sign with your uh, right, arm, right arm. Everybody make the OK sign, all right? Now just gradually bend your elbow, bring it up to your face, put it on your chin. Now what did I just say? Put it on your, and what are most of you doing? See, it, does, it doesn't matter what you say, it matters what you do. People do what you do. You want to be successful, put some systems into place. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the conference. I'll stick around if there's any questions. But other than that, everybody have a great show. Thank you, guys.